Ciao a tutti. Guess where I'm coming from? <laughs> I'm uh, happy to be there, very honored. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about a topic that it's very close to my heart, and of course, experience growth is the destination, but what is inspiring us to get to inject this growth into the work we do is the starting point I want to talk about. First of all, do you remember when actually doing design was feeling more like cooking? You needed to have good ingredient, inspiration, focus, and a good recipe that was helping you telling a story through what you were doing. You know, sometimes I think it's not just for me, but today it feels that function-driven design is making us feel more like in a drive through where everything has to be easy, fast, immediately resolved, that it's somehow changing the way we're doing design and the, the way we're actually providing impact with our work. You know, I, I take one step back and I introduce myself. Uh, I'm a designer from, from Italy. I'm uh, trained as an industrial designer. I'm a geek, so I kind of got into digital very early and moved towards product design and service design as well, so kind of an holistic perspective on what can be done. Uh, in my last almost now 20 years of experience, I kind of risked to spill my espressos on many different customer blueprints, journeys, wireframe sketches. I landed in 2020 in Sapient, uh, and there, you know, I thrived a lot in also exploring how the dimension of what we can do with design can merge also with a new perspective of what technology can help us uh, with, with doing. And, you know, I think it's somehow, for me, this is what is important for what design truly is to me and what design should be doing. Design isn't just about the form of it. The design is how it feels, how it works, what it means, and the story our products and services tell. I think this is, to me, the most important thing that we need to consider when approaching a new program. And, you know, I, I take this maybe because, of course, I, I was telling you I'm trained as an industrial designer. I'm Italian as well, so you can imagine that my background is filled with uh, uh, masters like Bruno Munari and Ettore Sozzas that kind of taught me through my training how important it is to have a vision in what to do. And, you know, at this time, when they were working as designers, the role was quite different from how we intend it today. And I want to just uh, go back to these to ask the question on what our role should be, especially now that we have artificial intelligence helping us to sort out the most, let's say, functional part of our work. You know, they were kind of using design to make societal impact, to make statements. They were not just designing, you know, the shape of a lamp or, uh, you know, just, just products. They were kind of meeting uh, a need a society had trying to tell their perspective on it and having a point of view that was the mean for them to meet brands that were like-minded and together with them build products and services that was making, were making the difference, that were making statements, that were changing lives. But not only that, because mo both of them, they were also very much engaged. They were also shaping education. They were shaping storytelling, they were active across different perspectives of what design could mean. Why I go back to them? Because, you know, I know that more and more we're getting so much focused on the craft and the execution to forget also our role into actually having the agency as designers to be having a point of view and to be actually using that point of view for shaping what we intend when we start a project. That's another big point that I have at the moment in, uh, as a question in my career. So humanism is the core of what we do. Uh, but being humanist, so putting humans at the center, doesn't mean to be human pleasers. Sometimes it feels like we just want to solve issues. We want to be, you know, like those helicopter parents that are just caring about what, what do you need as a user? What, what, can I, what can I do for you? What can I solve in your daily, in your daily life? But, you know, solving, I go back to the metaphor of, of, of the cooking, it's not what we usually need as people. We need, you know, we need perspectives. We need things that allow us to 
uh, you know, to, to act and to feel you know, fulfilled in what we do. So we need platforms more than things that solve immediately our needs. And if you think again about the metaphor I had from the drive through you know, if I just need to sort out my hungerness, I just need sugar. So a drive through you know, a hamburger <laughs> might sort it out. But if I have to talk about a, a meal I remember, it's difficult that I will mention that. It's more likely that I will mention that restaurant where I had an amazing experience, and I didn't get anything I was expecting, and I didn't get any food that was, let's say, planned to be what I needed before entering that restaurant. And you know, I urge you to think about that when you start your design, that, that that's somehow the spirit you need to, to take. Don't design just for replicability. Design for building the experience that moves your customers that builds upon the tension and not only on the immediate need they have, what they tell you they, they want to sort out. I mean, this is obvious, but I think that this will be even more important as we have AI supporting us. The good is something that we can resolve through a lot of means today, thanks to technology, thanks to modularity, but what about the great? That's where we need to focus, that's the call that we get today, we don't have to focus so much on just how we can use AI, but what is our role when we can use AI? How that requires us to be better, to be different, to be adding that perspective that moves us forward. And it's going to be more and more the challenge. So before we were, yeah, I heard that, of course, the worry of everyone is about losing jobs. You know, the problem is more than that. It's about, uh, you know, being challenged more, having to settle less for the average, and having to prove that you're one step forward than something that can be sorted out by a machine. That, that's the real challenge we need to face. And it's a, you know, it's a tricky one, but somehow, to what I was telling you before, it's also a very fascinating one because it will urge us to take our perspective and use them in what we do. Just not being average, just being different, just being uh, progressive, just thinking about what's coming next and not what is the today. I'll go back, and I like this image because when we talk about design research and understanding customer needs and so forth. Sometimes it feels like that. I don't know how it is for you, but it's like, OK, I have t these 10 needs my client has. OK, let's sort them out. One, two, three, four, five. Sorting them all, a lot of features for sorting them all, and that's done. My design is done. It's covering all of the needs I've, I've retrieved. But that, again, is not where we want to work. I believe a lot in the power of agency that is twofold. Agency, you know, is the fact that as humans, we tend to be willing to do things, to act upon things. On one side, there's a mindset for us as designers. What I was telling you before, we're not just doing things. We have an intention. We decided to, to be designers because we wanted to have an impact. Let's think about the type of impact. Let's think about the philosophy behind our ways of working that has somehow also to be a bit individual. It's not just collective. It has to be the vision we want to bring into the work we do. And on the other side, as a design goal, because as we were saying, we want our, our users, our customers, not to just be using our things, but to be inspired through the, the projects, the products, the services we build, the experiences we design into progressing, into moving forward. How we do that? Three things. That, that would be the ingredients to this recipe. First of all, intention. Building intention will be like just defining the road on which we work. The second one is motivation. That is the fuel that motivates us, of course, to, to uh, start uh, moving within this, this, this space. And finally, aspiration. It is our no star. Where are we headed? Where is our customer headed? When we design things, if we consider these three aspects, we are already going in the right direction. But how to do that? I'm going to be taking a reverse approach. So how we generate intention? We generate it through frictions. And I know this is weird for most of us, because I think, and I'm sure that 90% of our decks are filled with frictionless experience. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> in a slide two or three usually. But actually, good frictions are, first of all, what will differentiate experiences that can be you know, designed autonomously by any machine to what is actually intentionally designed by a human to create a, a, a custom experience. And secondary, it's the poses that allow you, through an experience, to stop and think and react uh, as, a, as a customer to that experience that will be more and more something that we will miss. Because I think it, all of you are already used to be always in, on the move with experiences you're, you're having. And the fact of having a pose, it's more and more luxury, not used anymore too. So I take an example here, I'm talking about, uh, was mentioned in MatTech, I'm talking about uh, Amplifon. Um, I've been working with, uh, with Amplifon for these last three years. Amplifon is uh, um, the largest uh, hearing aid retailer globally. Uh, we've been working with them on what is the full digital ecosystem for them, but as you can imagine, it starts as a friction because their customers are elderly people. So it's not like digital is their first, <laughs> their first uh, interface. And overall, uh, the very point of differentiation for Amplifon is actually the retail in-person experience. So what we've been building is a full ecosystem for both the patients and the, audio, the audiologists to try and reduce the time required for them to be tracking things and gathering information in order for them to gain more time of in-person interactions. And you know, it's a different perspective for a digital designer because usually you want your tool to be front and center, to be the only thing that they see, to design an app that they will always have in their hands and be interactive continuously. In this case, it's quite the opposite. We were designing something that had to be less intrusive, that had to be uh, more reassuring for a very particular type of customer, and especially for the audiologists that didn't have to take their time from the actual important thing that was interacting with the patient. Another thing, another experience in, the, in this case that was very interesting, and in this case was really building up on frictions, um, was this experience we, we designed for having people to try and experiment what it means to be hearing impaired. Uh, you know, one of the biggest issues with people with hearing impairment is the stigma. They feel, of course, uh, worried to be sharing their issue because uh, people with hearing impairment still today are, are, made, are, are feeling like that, that there will be jokes about their issue rather than feeling like it's something that needs to be solved. And so here, this work was to help people to feel what it really means to have this issue through a digital experience, understanding what it means to be skipping words, to not being able to fully understand the context, to feel isolated uh, while we're talking. And this is helping a lot in uh, having these people communicate with their family, with their uh, loved ones, and making them understand what it actually feels like to be hearing impaired. And finally, of course, we have, we have built a, a design system, so it's componentized. But again, where I want to take the friction part is that it is componentized, but we've worked a lot in order to create automation, but also you know, small elements of uh, complexity that allow us to move from a very plain design to something that, as you can see, it's a bit more complex with different typography, uh, uh, really with, with simple, small complications. More like when you think about the design of a Swiss watch, uh, the system is designed to allow to move from simplicity to complexity, depending the context, the customer type, the moment in the journey, uh, so that, again, not everything feels the same. So through your experience with the brand, you can have different moments of interaction depending on the type of, of customer you are in the moment in which you're experiencing. Second topic, we are at the fuel point. We were talking about motivation. And in this case, of course, we went beyond the fact that it's not said that we need to be frictionless. In this case, we talk about working through constraints. And to me, you know, constraints, when I was talking about the agency of the designer, is a good exercise against ourselves. Because sometimes we go in automatic mode when we get a brief, so we already know what is the best pattern for solving something. We know what are best-in-class apps that are doing the same things, best-in-class services. You do a nice benchmark, you take the best from that benchmark, and you try to replicate that. 
One exercise I always take also with my team is to try and put ourselves complications and constraints. Like, okay, what if we look at the benchmark, we do everything that the benchmark is doing, but like, we have something that no one has done before and we need to sort it out anyhow, even if it's not something already in the brief. In this case, for example, when we talk about constraints, the first word that I would talk always about is the automotive space. Uh, I talk about a project where we were thinking about redesigning configurators. We've done it for many brands, and through these experiences, what we've learned is that, as you can see, configurators all look the same because they're platform-driven, because they're so complex that you end up having always the same design patterns, having the same structures, also because it's very complicated to build a custom one. But you know, we asked ourselves, but in an era where most configurators most configurations are starting on a mobile. Is it normal that most configurators are designed for desktop? Is it normal that when they get to mobile, anyhow, they're designed in landscape mode only because people in the product, on the product side of automakers doesn't allow to think about cutting the picture of a car a bit? But you know, all of us are used to use our phones 99% in, in portrait mode, so why we should be designing for changing our ergonomy if we're not used to. And that's the prototype we built. So it was also for helping pushing forward the idea that from a technology perspective, we needed to rethink uh, this approach. The constraints we chose was we need to design it for portrait. It needs to be enabled by AI. We want it to be collaborative because most of configurators are just you and the, and the tool. Um, and we wanted also to think about different filtering paradigm, something that will allow both hyper-technical people to be tuning the micro details, but also people that were just you know, willing to play with a model to be doing that. And as you can see, the exercise was also a lot about injecting CGI and creating um, an experience that feels, so uh, our goal was, why don't we use the same way you're adding filters to your pictures on your camera roll and use that paradigm for creating an interaction with a configurator? No more just uh, having to tune the little detail, but just let's work through drivers, because most of the people don't even know how many options they have to tune. Then, of course, there's people that are more, you know, passionate about that, but we wanted to try and also, as you can see, sort out both people that wanted to change the detail and people that wanted to change the macro uh, driver. And through artificial intelligence, we're also um, using a collective information about what the choices are made from a majority of users to try and define automatically, depending on the driver, which is the color, what are the packages you add, what are the details you have depending on what the majority of other people that have chosen the same driver are doing. Much like you would use a prompt in, a, in, any, in any tool. And here you see there's a second part that is the sharing the configurator and having the possibility to tune it together with a, a friend, a, you know, a partner, someone that will have to choose the car with you, uh, that will be able to create, as you can see, the different, the different recipes for creating your final configuration and ideally decide whether to merge them and create the best model for both of you. And you know, again, I go back to the constraints because none of these would be feasible uh, in a space where you want to go with the simplest solution. But this is something that for automakers is super important because it's a branded asset. It's the way your customer interact and discover your model in your car. And you don't want to go with an average experience there. You want to go with something that a customer will remember. It's in a future where maybe you will go less and less to a dealership, it will be an important part of your experience. Uh, and has to, it has to be memorable and differentiated. It has to be a signature. And that's where constraints help us build branding. So last bit, I want to talk about also, when we talk about agency and the fact of acting, it's not always good. When we talk about agency, we are used to these. These pictures are coming from any of our social feeds. I don't know if you know about our social agency, but to me, that's like the nemesis of the type of agency as designers we should be building. Part social agency is the type of feeling you get from looking at other people that are acting that makes you feel like 
okay with yourself, like you have done your thing, like you see someone building a Lego and it makes you feel reassured, uh, or you see someone else making a recipe and it, it feels for you like you have done it. At the end of the day, you kind of feel tired when you have spent your life scrolling your Instagram or TikTok feed through this type of content. And that's, you know, something that is preventing us from having that good agency I was talking about, something that makes us feel the actors in, uh, in our life. And that's where I'm saying, as designers, we have the duty to be helping our society, our customers, to be focusing more on this latter positive agency rather than this one, because this one is something that already exists. It's something we are used to, because all of our digital experiences feel like something that, that is addictive. And those frictions is that, again, allow us to be posing and thinking and acting and going also out sometimes from the digital space. It's not bad. It can happen even if we're digital designers. Last part, we talk about the resonance. And I think in this case, a different bit, I'm talking about digital design earlier. This last part is about also consulting. I want to talk about aspiration as bringing beauty to what we do. And beauty has been something uh, in the last year, years, 10, 15, has been completely canceled from the design space. It's been pushed to brand and marketing as if in design it was against the functionalism, talking about the fact that our experiences had to be beautiful. And when I say beautiful, take it really in a you know, very wide sense. Uh, I mean beautiful in a sense that it's moving people, that it's inspiring people, that it's something that you'd remember, that, that, that you like. And in this case, I want to tell you that it's not just about products. And you've, of course, we talk about crafting uh, stuff that, that should be differentiated. But I'm talking about creating a different way into consulting, into creating artifacts that move organizations through beauty, that allow to story tell the change that an organization needs to take by using you know, beautiful wrapping to, to navigate through the organization in the right hands and having an impact. And you know it's super important to be doing that because whenever we deliver 150 slides of uh, pyramids and maps and charts and customer journeys that just land on someone's computer and they don't move from there, we have wasted our time. And in this case, thinking about storytelling uh, impact is so much important. It's so important for any type of brand, uh, but of course, particularly when we really want to have a transformational impact. Finally, the point is, of course, about Again, going back to the title of my talk, so growth. Why I took this long digression? Because for building growth, I believe that the experience-led approach requires focusing on what is sustainable for an organization. Um, and the sustainability is delivered just through meaning. So if we really put focus and agency in what we do, we can actually help organizations create things that have meaning, that are used for longer, that last longer for, our, for their customers, and therefore are automatically sustainable because they won't have to change so quickly and abruptly because they're not thought, they're not future-proof, they're not thinking about such evolution. What we do is, I mean, this is a, a strategy at Sapien, so we we try and, and, of course, make as much as possible the connection between the different capabilities. So speed, in this case, stands for strategy, product, experience, engineering, and data, partnering together in order to deliver such type of meaning to our customers. Of course, today I'm representing experience, so I'm going to be talking a bit partially about the role of experience in this, in this uh, uh, ecosystem. And sometimes uh, it feels like uh, being this girl here, the middle sibling. <laughs> Because you're there in the middle between your serious strategy and product colleagues and you know, the, the data and engineering teams that are instead, of course, rooting for, for tangibly building things. And, and you're there orchestrating the elements of value that connect across these, these different disciplines. Uh, somehow, understanding as a middle so child how to gather the attention of everyone through maybe sometimes small tricks, <laughs> like for example, before I was saying, uh, creating beautiful artifacts for, for 
crafting their attention into acting uh, positively. I couldn't close without an AI slide, but just because I wanted to also reconnect it to what we were saying before. I, I don't want to, for you to catch the point that I'm against AI, quite the opposite. I'm just saying that the more we are in the system where AI is so important to our ways of working, we need to make sure that we are not creating noise. We're not adding the noise. Our scope is to go down in that pyramid and be using AI to create signals, to create differentiated product, to create differentiated services. And for doing that, if you see the role, we need to get to use our vision for alimenting this, this uh, type of approach. We need to have a style that is nuanced. We need to ask for highly selected data sets for be working with AI. We need to be asking for more. We, be, we love to, to be the ones rooting for working on the great instead of the good, because no one else will be doing that. It's going to be our role to be making sure that we're not creating more, uh, let's say, trash products and services in uh, a very crowded ecosystem. So closing here, I think uh, for me the message is, is this. So what, what is about our role, uh, this middle child role? Let, let's never be content. Let's try and be always, as much as we can, bold with what to do. Let's not be afraid of doing that. Let's go back to those designers I was mentioning to you before that were not afraid of being bold because they knew what they wanted to, to bring to society. They had a clear mindset, so they weren't afraid of stating that. And most of all, let's question patterns. They're not stated. Patterns are something we learn. We are able to learn new patterns of course, in a reasonable way. But let's, again, try and push for creating new patterns rather than just uh, settle for the ones existing. That is all. Grazie. Is there any question? Any questions? OK, can There's you pass the mic here, please? Introduce yourself, then the question. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ridhima, and I'm from Deloitte. And thanks, Laura, for the amazing talk. Um, so uh, you asked me to introduce myself. I'm a six-month-old baby to UX. So and I'm very new. I come from an illustration background, and this is a playground for me. A lot of fun, good, great exposure. So forgive me if my question comes from an uninformed state. Um, I wanted to understand uh, what your first slide meant about generating intentions through friction. That caught my attention, but I don't think I was able to comprehend that very quickly. So, sorry, uh, can you repeat the first part? I, uh, generating intention through friction. Would you be able to elaborate? It's, uh, it's mostly about creating, uh, through this slowing down in the experience design, creating the intention for the person who's interacting with your systems to be willing to go forward. Not to go, you know, heads down forward just because it's simple, but because they intentionally want to interact with your system. And friction's allowed to create, it's not roadblocks, but just parts of the experience that slow down the flow. Okay. You know, we tend to instead just build everything so that it's as fast as possible and that you can go very quickly by the end of the flow. And you know, we've all been there, like for example, when building a, an e-commerce cart, removing all frictions is the best because you want your customer to buy everything, to buy everything in one second. But again, think it from a societal perspective. Do you really want people to just be buying things heads down without reason? Maybe you want to understand and specify those moments where actually this purchase is intentional in the experience. And I know it's, it's tricky to be presented to a client as a perspective, but it helps. I, I, go, I go so extreme to making this example of the card to make you understand what it means to start injecting moments in which you are evaluating what you're doing and making sure as a customer you're, you have actual intent in what you're doing. OK, so what I've been reading theoretically on books is that uh, learnability and friction, so to say, should be reduced in terms of uh, 
टाइम रिडक्शन आई मीन दे शुड नॉट बी एबल टू स्पेंड टाइम अ लॉट ऑन द प्रोडक्ट एंड इट शुड बी फास्ट पेस्ड राइट सो दिस थॉट अप्रोच सीम अ लिटिल काउंटर इंटिव दो इंट्रीगिंग सो डिड यू एवर फील दैट योर कंज्यूमर्स वर नॉट कम्फर्टेबल विद द फ्रिक्शन दैट यू वर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग टू दैम थ्रू द प्रोडक्ट वेल not not actually because of course you get to define the friction once you have defined the macro ecosystem i think the point is what is your role as designer if it's just creating the thing or consulting your client so sometimes you just i mean i take again the example i was making to you okay we focus on just maximizing the the sales in the cart but maybe you have a, a medium to long term vision and makes you understand it for that brand putting that friction and having that pause brings value to the brand itself because it's allowing people to be more conscious about the fact that they are buying through that brand it's not amazon it's that brand that is selling you the thing uh, and it's creating a relationship yeah. so of course yeah. you need you need to prove it <laughs> you need to support it with strategic data uh, but just for making you an example that it's not always said that that, that speed is the solution thanks i love it <laughs> thank you very else Any question? We'll take one more question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. I really, first thing, I really like the analogy of are we humanists or are we uh, trying to just human pleasers? Um, I I can't hear so much. Yeah. So can you hear me now? Yeah. So I really like the one that you where you questioned are we just human pleasers? And uh, I, I also we were talking about business impact. So sometimes as a designer, it feels like we're always working in isolation in the sense that. it's only us who is always trying to bring this perspective but i'm sure that even our non design colleagues are trying to create a good product right so how do we kind of uh, go from this constant battle of like tech first or design first to starting to speak a common language so uh, first of all of course i mean the speed perspective i was mentioning it's still about trying to work all together on these where of course somehow still the roles remain because each of us has its own angle that it's bringing to the table you know more and more what i'm seeing is that uh, um business optimization and technology standardization of the platforms is kind of killing completely this fact of being exploring in design but it's because we are not getting as early as possible into having an impact uh, so somehow this fact of learning how to speak business and technology in order to have that impact as early as possible and not be talking about just the needs resolved uh, but as i was making this example now trying to say okay let's not use the standard cart we need to change it we all know that changing a cart is a nightmare for any client and any technology platform because they have the standard approach but what if you are able to focus and partner with strategy to build a, a business case for doing that and you need to be the one suggesting that you can't just be heads down designing it so yeah you, you need to you need to upstream a bit uh, but it's worth it Thank you. 